is Amigos PC. If you were looking for a highbrow, fancy, smart, regal podcast with hosts that love to talk about horse riding, badminton, and trips to the vineyard, you're in the wrong place. This is Amigos PC. If you're looking for drinking, random nonsense, stunts, shenanigans, and balls out craziness, you've hit the jackpot. This is Amigos PC, and this is Scott and Mark. Welcome, everyone, to Amigos PC. Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space. You can always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. Apply today, become a member, and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co, P at, at P O D G O dot C O, and be sure to add podcast or be sure to add our podcast in How Did You Hear About Podgo section of the application, which is Amigos PC. Right? Yes, it I, is. I know you were going to chime in there. Good. No, you did good. Whatever. You did good. You, Whatever. you stumbled through it again. Typical. I know. <laughs> Our guest, Kim Lombard, joins us today. Uh, actor, writer, and producer. Um, recently, you did you write or did you uh, co-write uh, Pink is In? Hi, Mark. Hi, Scott. Yes, uh, I... Um... I wrote it. I wrote, uh, we've, we've done four episodes and they're up and running. And yes, I, I am the writer and I have a, a small role in the show as well. Oh, okay. Uh, wh- what's the role? Like? So they- I, the, the, I'll, I'll give you the premise of the show. It's, uh, it's about a poorly run women's prison. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't focus on the, on the inmates as much as it focuses on the completely inept uh, administration that runs the prison. And I played the CEO, Pitt Barnett, uh, drunk, stoned, uh, completely out of his mind. Every idea he has is horrible. The prison's falling apart, and he just comes up with the most ridiculous ideas, like um, a selfie with a con, you know. And uh, they made like 20 bucks on that one. So the, the, the premise of the, of the show just basically is just how ridiculously uh, poorly the, the prison is run. Okay. That is awesome, and, and you also work with one of our friends of the show, Trish, Trish Rayoni, right? Yep. Isn't she a part of? Uh, yeah, that's how. That's I know that's how we. Yeah. yeah I, I think you, you meant to say the amazing Trish. Yeah, she is amazing. We, yeah, yeah, a wonderful woman and a, and a great actress, and she plays a character called Top Dog, um, and <laughs> so, so and she, man, she's added so much to the show. Does that mean she's she hands just... out the the prison shanks then? Not not to spoil. <laughs> Hey, spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, she runs the Shanks thing. Well, so, yeah. Top dog. I mean, come on. Right? Yeah, yeah. She's awesome at carving uh, Shanks out of old toothbrushes. <laughs> I believe it. I can see Trish doing that. Oh, yeah. Uh, we were corresponding back and forth on the emails as we were preparing for this. <laughs> that we prepared for this. Um, you had... Uh, Give me a couple uh, items about you. One thing that, or one that fascinated me was uh, you eat your weight in aerosol cheese. Whoa. Yeah, it was on a bet. Uh, <laughs> it was either that or I had to eat a urinal, po- uh, urinal puck. So oh, I, I chose the aerosol the cheese. cheese spray. Uh, I used to be in a band. So, uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, debauchery and vomiting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I toured. I was on the road for about 30 years. And, um or as I say, 30 years and eight girlfriends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we just, you know, I have many, many, many road stories uh, and, and luckily your podcast so we can get away with telling some of them. Oh, yeah. No, we would love to hear any of those for sure. So what, what bands were you in? Yeah. Well, you know, pr- primarily I was, uh, I toured around Canada. Uh, I'm living, I live just west of Toronto and um so mostly you wouldn't know anything I've done simply because we were here in, in, in Canada. But I did have a band in Los Angeles in the 90s called Big Big Time. And it was a pop rock thing with two drummers and uh, big on the vocal department, kind of along the lines of a Def Leppard. 
Okay. And as with all bands, it, it eventually imploded because we had, you know, five guys uh, living in a two bedroom apartment in uh, in uh, La, on La Cienega. I don't know how familiar you are with Los Angeles, but uh, we lived on La Cienega at Melrose. So we had like four cars and we had, you know, five guys in the band. And of course, the singer always has to have his girlfriend there. So she came down and of course, she had two dogs. So, you know, it was only a matter of time before there was going to be an incredible explosion of, uh, of egos. And so the band eventually imploded. But uh, it was a good time. Um, I, I, oh man, I can tell you lots of stories about uh, living on those, you know, those uh, top ramen noodles, the four for a dollar oh, ones. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I ate a lot of those and then figured out, hey, what if we add frozen peas to it? It's way more nutritious. So, you know, we lived on top ramen and and then one day the uh, the I, I played drums. The other drummer was at a place called Rock and Roll Ralph's. It was a, uh, a grocery store and uh, he came home with an expired carrot cake. So that's what we had for dinner one night, you know. That's too funny. Did you guys ever fight? <laughs> Did you guys, what, what was... What... What was one of the fights you guys may have had in the house? Was it like over a hot pocket or something? Someone took some of the food? Like, like what kind of things did you guys get into as far as being crowded in a house in a two-bedroom? Well, it, you know, it's funny. It was, uh, we were pretty good at staying away from one another, and there wasn't really any food to argue over, so that never happened. But uh, we, ended up, we ended up having to break down and, uh, and get jobs, so we all worked for uh, United Van Lines. And so in the day, you know, it's like 100 degrees out, and we're, we're slugging furniture, and then at night we'd go out and gig, and then sometimes you actually had to pay to play. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was only a matter of time before, like, wow, this ain't working. So, um, so you know, as with all bands, unless you can afford therapy, um, they, that band imploded. I ended up coming back to Toronto and uh, putting a new band together and, uh, you know, just carried on here. And, and uh, funny enough, three of the guys still live in L.A. and they're all uh, they're all still messing around with music. So. Oh, nice. That's so, really cool. With it being in like a two bedroom apartment, where did you guys practice? Oh, we actually had a rehearsal place. Um can't quite remember where it was but that was a that was a deal too because i remember one night so you got to load your gear in do the rehearsal and then load your gear back out and one night we were uh we were loading out and the guy that ran the place he was a gigantic guy it, i think he was an ex-nfl football player he was about six seven and he was standing on the sidewalk with his arms folded and i said to him bob what are you doing and he goes oh dude you skinny white boys you're not going to live get your equipment into the van before it's all going to be uh taken away so uh he was basically our bodyguard while we loaded in and out of the building you know <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> so so it must have been like a shoddy kind of area obviously two bedroom you guys all had to you know cram in there uh, oh yeah oh you yeah we, well actually we 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 actually uh where we lived was okay but but where we rehearsed was yeah uh, you wanted to wear a kevlar vest if you could gotcha yeah and then you being a, a writer, uh, so uh, were you writing some of the songs too, or who took that responsibility while you guys were in the band? Actually, I wrote most of the material, strangely enough, as the drummer. You wouldn't normally hear that, but uh, yeah, I wrote most of the material. It was actually a really cool band because the uh, we all met in Toronto, but the, the guitar player was from um, Birmingham, England, or as he called it, Birmingham. And uh, <laughs> the uh, bass player was from Adelaide, Australia. And then the three of the rest of us were from Toronto, but uh, it was a, it kind of had a cool sound just because of where we were all from, and we were influenced by so many different things. So, but initially, I'd bring down the basics of the song, and then we we turn it into something. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just recently had uh, Vic Briggs on. Uh, he he used to be the guitarist between '66 and '68 of the Animals. Oh wow! And he was giving us stories about you know all the I don't want to say antics, but like people he met and. Uh, just yeah, stories from England and stuff like that, and, and over in LA and stuff like that. It was pretty neat. Hearing his yeah, it, it, it's amazing the amount of the number of people you meet uh, touring. Because I, I was very lucky and got to open for some pretty big acts over the years. Um, and um, yeah, just just hanging out and and you just run into all kinds of people. And I'm sure he had many stories about brushes with greatness. Yeah. Oh yeah, you, me you mentioned Hendrix, he Hendrix saw the Beatles, some, some of the Beatles. Beatles. So, do you have any memorable th um, meetings with some greats uh, while you were doing your stint in LA? 
Well, I do have a couple of weird stories about running into people, not necessarily having played with them. But one time I was, when I lived in New York, the, the band was in Manhattan for, I think, a year and a half. And we were walking down the road, the guitar player and I were walking down the road. And there was a guy kind of shuffling towards us and he had a kayak and it was on a little trailer that he was pulling. So it had like two wheels behind him. And uh, holding the holding the kayak, and yeah. I said to the guitar player Tim, I said, "That's David Lee Roth," and he goes, "No, it's not." And as he passed us, it was David Lee Roth pulling a kayak through the streets of Manhattan. Wow! <laughs> and then my other story, my other one was, uh, and this is weird too. I came around a corner in lower. I remember I was on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and and I nearly bumped into Rick Ocasek uh, from the Cars, guitar mm. player from the Cars. He yeah. wrote all their hits. Brilliant. Just recently passed away. Uh, and hand to God, about a week later, I was in L.A. doing something, and I I, pa- I went around a corner and nearly banged into Rick Ocasek a second time. You guys are just following each I other know. across the yeah. United States. So you were you guys were in New York? No, so was New York prior to L.A.? Or, or? That's right. We did. We lived. Uh, we first we uh, were, were lucky enough to. Uh, so when we lived in Toronto, we were kind of touted to be the next big thing. So we were able to get a ton of paperwork together, which allowed us to showcase for record companies in New York. And uh, one night we were supposed to have this big management company see us, but they decided to go see this piece of shit band called uh, Nirvana. <laughs> so, oh. so they never showed. They never came to see us. And I remember we were playing the. We had to play anyway, but they didn't come out to see us. And there was barely anyone in the crowd. And then uh, somebody in the audience. We got talking to somebody in the crowd, and they went, "You know, you guys would be doing would do a lot better in Los Angeles." So that's how we ended up packing up and going down there. Oh wow! wow. Just yeah. so, so you guys got passed up for Nirvana. <laughs> Yeah, that was awesome. Like we just we're like, who the fuck is Nirvana? You know. <laughs> wow. So, uh, all of you know your, your music career that you, you were building. Like, what? How? How did the transition come to where you're um, an actor and a writer now? Wow, yeah, that's that's another kind of an interesting story. I um, when I got kicked out of my own band in L.A., I I lived in my car for about three weeks and then a friend of mine found out I was living in the parking lot at Pavilion in West Hollywood and he said are you out of your freaking mind he goes you're going to get shanked with Rich. a toothbrush you see how I did yeah, that another another Trish yeah. reference I like it yeah thank you I, I'm thinking about her a lot yeah. so uh so anyway so I'm living in my car and then he goes no no you got to come you know come stay with me because you're gonna you're gonna get killed so <laughs> Anyway, so I stayed with him for a while, and then finally I went, you know what, I, I, I think I'm just going to pack up. So I, I went back to Toronto, and then I, I made an album. I, I bugged a producer. I swear, I bugged him for about 18 months, and, and you can look him up. His name's Rich Chicky, and he he's done so many great things. Mostly he engineered uh, Rush stuff. After me, okay. he, he ended up working for Rush. Um, but I bugged him for about 18 months, and we did an album called Bitter, because that's how I felt. And... Um, we it, the CD came out and and I was all where was I going with this story? Oh yeah, so anyway, so the CD came out and um, and of course it sold like twenty two copies, you know. So now I'm at the pits of despair a second time, and I get a call out of the blue from a crazy cousin I have in Montreal, and he said, "Listen, I'm starting a company in France, and I need a guy to come over and help me." And I'm like, "Well, what is it?" And he said, "Well." I need you to be a motion capture actor. And I said, well, what is that? And he, <laughs> a motion capture actor, they, they act out video games and, and, and cartoons, essentially. So you stand in what's called a boxing ring, and they put triggers all around your body. Mm-hmm. And there's a semicircle. Of, this is, I'm, again, I did it in 99 to 2001. So there's a semicircle of, of these animation guys, and they're telling you, okay, now you're running, or now you fall down, or I need you to jump through a window. So it was the most amazing job. I ended up there, like I said, I think I, I think almost two years. Um, I lived in the French Alps doing this animation thing, and wow. um, and uh, yeah, it was a, the most incredible experience. And and I got to do some voice work in the cartoons they were doing, so that was fun. And it was really cool too because being there for two years, I, I didn't learn more than about five words of French because every time you try to speak French, they say to you, "Well, you know." Uh, uh, French is a very uh, difficult language. Uh, uh, so then, and so they want because they want to learn English. So yeah, it, it, yeah. every time I tried to speak in French, they, you know, bust out and try their English. So I never did learn how to speak French, but I did teach uh, France how to speak English. <laughs> almost, 
almost the whole country. Yeah, that explains a lot. Then, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Man, so, what an interesting. I mean, travels. I mean, it makes me feel like I've done nothing. <laughs> France, Sorry, we, world. I mean Canada. Did, I mean, yeah, I know you live there, but that's still more than here. For me. Yeah, it was just that was that one was a lot just luck, yeah. but uh, it was really great too because I happened to live halfway up the side of a mountain. So every day uh, I got to ride down the hill. On I didn't have a car, so I rode a mountain bike uh -huh. and I go down the mountain to work and then grab a coffee on the way down. And then all day long we were pounding espresso. So I was so wired for sound I could ride up the mountain after work, you know, because <laughs> right. I'm just so wired, right? But you know, uh, yeah, it was a good time. Do you know what game, or by chance, or did they tell you what game you were doing that for? Like, yeah, well, the biggest one I did was a French one, and, and you can look it up. It's called Largo Winch, and he was kind of this billionaire 007 character that I got to play. And I, I, to be honest, I don't know, even know you know what happened with it after my end of the job is done. They just package it up and, and, and sell it. I did. I don't know that end of the business, but to, the actual uh, creation and making of. of of the video game was amazing. It was so interesting. I loved doing it. So essentially, you had to wear like a wet suit, like the, the black suit, and then they put all the little balls all over you. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and the way when I was doing it, it was pretty new technology. So um, they used to gaffer tape me. I was taped in. Oh. And now, now the suits are way better. But when I did it, there was somebody always fixing the trigger because it would always they would slip and move. There was one on your neck and stuff. So uh, now they're way better. Yeah, it looks like it was a, well, this one that I'm seeing, it's a, it was released in 2002. There yeah, a, that would be it, probably. Yeah, it yeah. U, Ubisoft game. That's a, that's a big oh, developer. That's a big yeah, yeah, it was Ubisoft, yeah. yeah. and it came out for PlayStation 2, GameCube, and the Xbox. Wow, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'll have to look it up. Oh, it was a great gig, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, just running around and doing what they tell you. I mean, and getting paid. And, and you're in Fran or France, right? I mean, that's even crazier. Yeah. France, France is a really cool place, um, uh, except that it's the kind of place where, like, restaurants will close for lunch so the staff can go home and have lunch. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, crazy. We always, used to say, we always used to say, welcome to France. I'm sorry we're closed. Because everything was always closed, you know? Wow. And then one time I remember talking to one of the French guys, and I said, well, what do you mean we can't get these screws? We need it. We were building a studio there. And I said, well, I need these screws. And he goes, well, the, the store's not open. And I said, well... In North America, the Home Depot is open 24-7. And he goes, <laughs> why? And then I thought, yeah, he's right. He's right. Yeah, why? Why? <laughs> why is it? Yeah. yeah. That is true. I mean, they, you do hear like over in Europe and stuff, they have those holidays or they have those, they have a lot more easier work weeks than, you know, the North America people as far as working longer. And they, oh, they think, listen, you're absolutely right. They yeah. think we're insane. Um, yeah. They, uh. There, for example, in, on the they would never work overtime and they would never work um, uh, weekends. They just it was unheard of. And so you'd always come in the office on a Saturday. It would be the American guys, the British guys, the English guys, and the guys from uh, Australia. And the, all the French guys were at home. <laughs> they they got it right. We're the nutcases working. Yeah, no, it's right? so true. Did you do any touring while you were there and, and you know, like the touristy things of like going, going to see countries the, or... the, the Eiffel oh, Tower? The... Um, yeah, how people nowadays, they do like their glamour social media shots and you know, they got to gotta take a picture yeah. with one thing. Did you do anything like that? I, I, I did. I, I've been very, very lucky in, the, in, the, in that way because where we were situated in France, we were about 40 minutes away from Geneva, Switzerland. So we were constantly going into Geneva and hanging out at this Irish bar because everybody spoke English. And um, so I used to go there a lot. But yeah, I've, I've been very, very lucky. I've been, I went, I went uh, because we're in the center of Europe and the flights are super cheap. If you're flying within Europe, it's very, very cheap. So yeah, I was lucky enough to see Stonehenge and Lots of stuff in London, uh, England. I'm a big fan of England. Anything weird happen at Stonehenge while you're there? Aliens show up or anything? You gotta tell. Uh, <laughs> oh no! Um, let me listen. Listen, I, I don't have a story about Stonehenge, so I'll have to make something up. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it was, but it was fascinating, and and they're discovering there's more of it than they realized. I mean, they're starting to see these bizarre runway things that they didn't realize were there, and and actually some of the stones. This is kind of cool. 
some of the stones are missing because or about a hundred years ago they didn't realize what this was so they would take the stones and you know put them in the local houses like make them fences and stuff out of this yeah. <laughs> super old rock that you can't even find in the area uh, but they didn't realize what it was at the time so can you imagine being the guy that like had to go to those houses and be like hey stone we need back. this back yeah Listen, sorry to bug you, but uh, you know that rock that's been there a hundred years? We need it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, hold, it's holding up the side of my house. Uh, we need it. We need, it's already, no, it's got to go back yeah. to its, it's gotta place. Go. We, got, we have to move it. That's hilarious. Did you, so did you learn those type of things when you went to visit Stonehenge, or is that something you learned after the fact? Uh, actually, with with regards to Stonehenge, yeah, I, I didn't know much about it. I just knew it was something you were supposed to go and see, and it yeah. was pretty mind-blowing. Um, but no, I, to be honest, no, I didn't know a whole lot about it. I, I was, I'm like really fascinated about like the whole thing with Stonehenge because there, there are theories, you know, it could be aliens or, it, you know, it could have been mm-hmm. just, you know, um, what, uh, what else would it have been? Other, well, people, people that lived there at the time. Oh, age, uh, people you know, under the earth? What yeah. about under the earth? People? Oh, under, under the earth? You never know. Oh, like Baron Von Trump what? traveling Who's under that? the earth? What? You never seen it? You never no. heard that story? No. It's a very good book. You should listen to it. <laughs> because Sorry, he, he knows I won't read it. <laughs> That's why I said I'll listen to it. You should well, listen to the, that book. Just look at the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it's not a picture book, if it's not on video or audio, it's, it, it won't it, work. It doesn't exist. It doesn't work. Yeah. So I also see here that you've been in 28 commercials. Is that a lot of those were in Canada, maybe? or where, where did you Yeah, go? only a couple were in the U.S. I did a Michelob Light uh, commercial that was sort of a regional Chicago, Illinois type thing. But um, yeah, so uh, everything I did, it was actually a, a funny. Do you, do you know Black Label Beer? I don't. Is that an American one? or Anyway, what happened to me was because I was in a band, I was this sort of long, I had long blonde hair, semi-muscular looking dude, you know, so I was in every beer commercial. Uh, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden this black label beer came out and it was all very, very uh, dark and brooding. Everything was shot in black and white. And then my agent goes, yeah, you're probably never going to work again, you know, because they finished with the sort of long haired blonde dude, you know, drinking his beers and they've gone to this sort of dark brooding look. And uh, so, yeah, I was very lucky. I did a whole bunch of stuff, Kentucky Fried Chicken, the usual General Motors stuff, cookie commercials, cereal commercials. Um, can't even picture, remember. Do you have a picture of you dressed as the colonel? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that, is I think I would want to be dressed as a chicken, but yeah, no. <laughs> you usually, I mean, well, nowadays, at least, the newer commercials, there, it's, it's always... You know, yeah, it's like a celebrity in the in the as colonel as the colonel now. Yeah, right, right. That's yeah, what they've been doing. No, mine mine wasn't quite that. Uh, I remember my line in that commercial. Actually, it was a KFC thing, and I was supposed to be a rock guitar player. And uh, and I just go, somebody hands hands me a chicken sandwich or something, and I go, oh yeah, man, it's only ninety nine cents. That was it. About oh. twenty nine takes, and I think they all sounded the same. And uh, yeah, anyway. That was awesome. that was my moment of glory for for KFC. When they do that, is 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 that something that's like annoying or like you mean the twenty eight takes like for the same feel, thing? Yeah, is that what you mean? That, yeah. yeah. No, no. To be honest, because uh, usually the pay is so great, and uh, <laughs> you think this is just leading to a, a role next to Leonardo DiCaprio or something, yeah. you know. Um, no, actually, it's not. It's 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 a lot of fun, and I, again, I was really lucky to to get a bunch of stuff. Um, I played drums in. Uh, I don't know if you remember a movie called Eddie and the Cruisers. That sounds familiar. Oh yeah, it was a pretty big film. Well, they made a sequel, e- Eddie Lives, and it was it was Eddie and the Cruisers too. And I was the drummer who gets kicked out of the band, and uh, I was thinking, how fitting, you know. So, uh, but anyway, I'm so excited. You know, I played drums in. Uh, I forget the hit. The song was by the Beaver Brown Band, and it was a big hit that I played played the drums on uh, in the movie. I didn't do the recording of it, and uh, so I'm waiting for the movie to come out. I'm all excited. I'm all excited, and the movie comes out, and I look at the reviews in the newspaper, and the Toronto Sun's review of the film was somewhere, somehow, somebody's made a movie worse than this, but I don't know when. Oh. oh. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was brutal. It was absolutely unwatchable. So, 
when you said, did you read the script prior to taking the role? Oh yeah, I'm curious. Like, did you think like when you read that, you're like, you're this, like this might this might be something awesome? Oh, oh, or you, you hope mean, everything. Like a... Yeah, I mean, you, you you truly hope everything right. is awesome. But yeah. but you you get there and, and you realize there's a heck of a lot of luck involved because even if it reads well as a script, you know, there's so many phases it has to go through that yeah. it comes out and it's like a turd, you know, and. <laughs> And you're like, what? What happened from the paper to the finished product? You know. Right. You made, well, you made that little comment there, like it kind of felt a little similar to a life experience, maybe, and, th- and that's why I was asking you, it's like, did you read the script prior? Did you feel like you would fit this role perfectly? Or. Well, no. To be honest, at my my stage of the game, um, you're just happy to get a part. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and my agent's going, "You're not turning anything down." You know, so. Yeah, and and so I was lucky enough to, to get in that film, but it just it just wasn't a particularly good picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that that came. I'm looking it up now. 1989 is when that came out. Oh wow. Yeah, we shot it in yeah. Montreal. Montreal. And actually, the the lead actor in that he was a really nice guy. He's still around doing stuff. His name's Michael Pere. Yeah, I'm seeing that. <laughs> yeah, you probably see him if you look him up. He's done a ton of stuff, but uh, super nice guy. And he was in Gone Girl. Or no, Gone. That's a oh, recent movie. I was be like, Whoa. Not Gone Girl. That was the Ben Affleck movie, wasn't yeah. it? Yes. He was in yeah. Gone. That's the most recent one. But yeah, oh, Lincoln Lawyer. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's cool. He's in Lincoln Lawyer? That's what it says. Yeah. Really? Wow. That's was, interesting. That's a good a, film. He was a de- detective. Yeah, it was a good movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're Googling. You know, that's got to be on top, right? It's something like that. Or bottom? No, that's gross. <laughs> It's getting weird now. Just swap. Yeah. I mean, just, just be quiet. Come on. I'll okay. move on. All right. So now that we're in the awkward stage of the show, what, what are we talking about next? <laughs> Funny. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. No, uh, no. Carry on. <laughs> carry on. <laughs> this guy, yeah. The, it, it, our chemistry is very awkward when it comes to <laughs> no, of, yeah, no, not yeah. all the time. Oh, no, no, you should so, see the group, so far so good. Yeah, the you group know? text that we have is oh, that's beyond. Awkward. That's different. Yeah, it's it's another thing, another crazy animal. So, this is Gary. <laughs> so is that one of the roles you played before? Or? <laughs> no, this is Gary, my finger puppet. He comes everywhere with me. I got him in 1981. That's oh, awesome. He's been everywhere. Oh, gross! <laughs> no, no, I, no. He was. I washed him. Sorry. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, you set me up perfectly there. That's all right. I, I can carry on doing that if you want. <laughs> so, um, with, with Pink is in. Yeah, let's talk more about that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a great show. Where Where did you? So. I, was there inspiration for, yeah, from, for the show? Like, were you in a women's prison at one point? Scott or, hasn't read our emails, by the way. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, mean, <laughs> so I know some of the background. Oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So okay, so this is good. So I, I get to find out things. Yeah. What? Oh, I just asked. Yeah. So was there what, what what inspiration did you have to to start Pink as in? Uh, well, actually, so I, I was approached by um, a woman named Lisa Crawford, and uh, she said she had she had been on a she played a prison guard in a in a mockumentary that has, a show that just came out. It's called New Eden. And uh, while she was there, she started saying she's she's a South African woman, and she said that she had never seen a comedy about about a prison. So I said, well, there's actually something called Orange Is the New Black. But I said, but if you, but she said, and then she replied. Oh, and then, uh, but anyway, so I said to her, but you know what, if you don't focus on the inmates and you make it more about the, the, the administration, then you've got an angle, you got a niche. So we pulled it, she pulled everything together. We shot a little 90 second trailer and that was the end of it. I, I walked away and I carried on with my sad little life. And a couple of months later, she called me, she goes, well, I got a deal. I'm like, what? Oh, wow. And so I, she asked me to write uh, an episode, which turned into four, which turned into eight, and now it's turned into 12. Oh, nice. So, yeah, it's been pretty cool. So the first four have come out, and as of last night, uh, apparently it's the number one show on this. It's a, just a little network, but it's it's a, it's a 
it, it's number one in the you know the most favored uh, show at the moment. So um, and then the idea is that they kind of watch it and see how it does, and then they bump you up to the bigger network. So um, that's what we're hoping for anyway. But uh, yeah, it was quite shocking to me to be honest because you, you you do I've done a million of these kind of things where you write and do a little demo, and uh, and then it's like that's the end of it. You pass it around and everybody goes, wow, this is a really crap idea, and we're like, you know, okay, perfect, and then you move on to the next one, but. This one, she's. I, I almost dropped the phone. She said, "Yeah, yeah, I, I, okay, I got a green light." And I'm like, "What?" So yeah, so it wow. uh, came about in a kind of an odd way, but it's it's it couldn't be more fun. But Trish, for example, because I know we we all know her, um, was hilarious to work with. She was she's so talented yeah. and such a nice person, and um, so you know I, I can't wait to to sh start shooting the next episodes, and um, yeah, we'll see what happens. So when you you did like the trailer or the, the intro into it uh, that pilot that pilot episode, where did you draw the storyline? I mean I know I, you know it's in a prison, uh, a female prison, yeah yeah things like that, administration like, yeah. So um, that's an interesting question actually. So I've always been interested in comedy. When I was a kid, you know my my mom and dad would would take us to the drive-in all the time, and I've you know I've seen all the Jerry Lewis stuff, and I've, I've uh, my whole family are big comedy types. Uh, you know, Mike Myers went to my high school. I did. I did not know him, but he, you know, it, there's lots of funny around me my whole life. Uh, you know, in, uh, Howie Mandel went to my high school. Um, you know, there's, there's a number of guys that you know did well. There's another guy named Maurice Lamarche that went to my high school, and you probably don't know his name, but you've heard his voice a million times. He's on Family Guy. He's on. You know, he's on the. The Simpsons. He's on Futurama. He's he's Pinky, I think, from Pinky and the Brain. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah. So he, you know, he went to my high school. So comedy all around, you know. So um, I I started to write, and uh, and then finally went, no, nah, no, nah, I I, I got to do this right. So I got on a plane and I went to England and I I signed up for school there. I went to Thames Valley University in London, England, and learned how to write comedy because I love British comedy. It's to me, it's the best. So I show up on the first day of school and they start talking and they're all talking about everybody loves Raymond and King of Queens. And I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you people? British comedy is the best, you know? And then they said, well, we like Frasier. So then I found common ground because I think Frasier is really well written. Yeah. Um, but I'm a huge fan of British comedy. And what's really interesting is all the reviews we get for Pink is in. Almost all of them have said, wow, this has got a real British vibe to it. So that's a huge compliment to me because I love that stuff. Like I'm a big fan of um, the IT crowd or I don't know if you know that show. It's, it's It was brilliant. Um, uh, Little Britain. I don't know oh, if you know Little I, Britain. I've heard of Little Britain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're really funny shows and they're they're out there. You know, the hu British humor is just out there. Um, I am Alan Partridge, and I'm saying maybe you don't know these shows, but maybe some of your listeners do. Yeah. Uh, I am Alan Partridge is another one. I Green Wing, one. Um, and anyway, the list goes on and on. And uh, I'm a big fan of Ricky Gervais. Uh, I was going to um, ask. Yeah. You know, I, I, to be honest, I've never seen the American version of The Office, but I saw the British version, and it's so brilliant. It's just so brilliantly written. And um, and then he did one called Extras, which is about background extras. Yeah. And and I was a background extra for years. You know, uh, it was a great way to pay some bills and uh, you know and connect with people. And I was also a I was also a stand-in for a few movies, as well. So uh, it, it it taught me, you know, just being on sets. It just you just watch and learn what's going on. A stand a stand -in as a non set on the set kind of person. A stand-in is that someone that you basically like you're setting the cues for when the when the actor comes on, like you're just being like in the position kind of thing. Is that what that is? Or you're absolutely right. Yeah. So uh, the last thing I did was um, oh crap, I can't think of his name. Um, he was uh, one, the guy I stood in for was uh, oh his name's David Thewlis, and David Thewlis apparently is in the Harry Potter movies, mm. and he's in one of my favorite movies, which I'm sure you gentlemen have seen, called The Big Lebowski. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's yeah. he's in The Big Lebowski. Uh, he's the guy that just laughs like an idiot constantly. Uh, but point of the story is that yeah, you're right. You you you're basically. Uh, so they can they can chillax in their uh, in their in their motorhomes. You're standing on set while they light you, because you kind of got to look like the person, especially skin tone and hair color. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was a stand-in for quite some time, and 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 you know by being a stand-in, you can watch what's going on and learn the various departments in the film on the film crew. It's a good experience. Yeah, that's awesome. 
So, did she uh, bring... Who's she? The, the, um, Lisa? Yeah, Lisa. Sorry yeah. about that. Uh, That's she, all right. Did she bring the idea to you? Or you said that, right? She brought the idea of the prison, yeah. uh, female prison. And then you're like, let's... Uh, Try to focus on the administration because of Orange is the New Black, and they focus. That's right. On, on the, yeah, the yeah. Because I, I, I was sort of saying to her, you know, we've kind of seen this already. There's another one called Wentworth. Oh yeah, uh, that one's on Netflix. Netflix. So, yeah, it's a little darker. I, I think I, I've that. never seen Me it, neither. but I think it's. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we we ended up um, just, and this this show's just as silly as it gets, you know. Um. And and so I, I I'm hoping and and we think it's it's that much different than say orange is the new black you know because we've seen that already so we're trying to do something a little different um well i mean orange is the new black has been out with like nine ten seasons now i think, I think they're done already well yeah i don't like, know the show's done yeah but, i mean it's been long enough to where like you it something could new be, yeah, re, yeah. Re, re, revamped kind of like a new idea from Reba. the prison yeah world yeah so i think it, yeah it'll be good for sure Clearly yeah, it's like it's it. like I said, it's it's getting rave reviews. Like it's quite quite surprising actually. Uh, it's it's picking up steam really quickly, and that's not easy, you know, because tons of shows come out and and uh, and they they come and go, and you're like, what? It's already over. I didn't even see it yet, you know. Well, um, so this one's getting noticed. It's crazy. You, you got you you didn't even plan for it to get picked up, but then it got picked up for four episodes, and all of a sudden went to eight, and now like you said, twelve, and mm -hmm. I, it, it seems like it's. A journey that it's unexpected, right? Yeah. Um, Cinderella it, story, even. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, it's funny you say that because uh, Lisa Crawford always says well, it was such an underdog story, yeah. and really by rights it shouldn't have happened. But um, the team was really good. Like the the, the director of photography um, is a guy just moved to Canada from from uh, Texas. And so he came with a different sort of take on things. And it's like when I was talking about my band, Big Big Time, uh, where, uh, you know, the guitar player was from England, the bass player was from Australia. And and so with this this situation, the DOP comes from, from Texas. So he's got a different slant and a different take on things. Um, the director is an Israeli dude. He, he just immigrated to yeah, Canada from that. Tel Aviv. Yeah. So, you know, so that also brings... Um, it, it makes things different because you're getting ideas from all over the place, you know, and makes for a unique uh, sort of look. That's awesome. Is the prison, because I, I have, unfortunately I have not seen any of it, is it taking place in Canada, the prison, or is it in another country? Because I'm, I'm just wondering, like, if you get the, the awesomeness of that you have all these people from different parts of the world, like, are you getting different feels of how prison life is in other countries? Because that, that might play into how it can mold the show too yeah well actually that's kind of an interesting point you're making as well because we we actually hired uh, a woman who has a really her name's emily o'brien and she she served time in a women's prison she was uh, i i don't want to spoil the story but i think she was a drug mule nice. and she got caught in toronto i think I, I hope i have this right and she went she went to a woman's prison maximum security prison so I referred to her a couple of times for things they're allowed to do, things they're not allowed to do. Um, and she was very helpful as sort of a consultant. Um, and, and again, that's what, to, to your point, it, it helped to make the show different again, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and everybody, like uh, Lisa Crawford's from Durban, South Africa. Mm, she, she immigrated yeah. to Canada as well. So everybody's coming from different areas of the world and it, it makes for a more unique uh, vibe. I mean, I, I just think of it like, cause like, the, like the prisons here in America, they seem to be, I don't know. For profit. For profit, right? Like, it's just like, you know, whatever. You know, they try to put up as many as they can in, and they're just making money on it, and it's all self-made money kind of situation. And then other countries, you see, they just throw a whole bunch of people just in a place, and it's like a community. And they just hang out, and they all cook there, and, like, it's, it's a whole other world in, in other countries. So I just wondered if, like, something like that... Obviously, you can't blend it all together, but something like we, that basically takes place. Well, we certainly, uh, we don't really say whether it's a maximum or a minimum pr uh, security prison, yeah. you know, because you're right, there are different types. And uh, because I'm trying to keep it lighthearted, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't really delve too much into exactly what the prison is, but uh, the idea is that it is a privately run prison. Nice. Okay. Are there uh, love interests in, in, in the show and, and things like that, or... Have you guys 
decided not to go that route. Or I know you. What? Could, yeah. That's the orange of the new black. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's what that is. Well, you know, it, it, it without you know, I, I should hold up a sign that says "spoiler alert." But yeah, um, yeah no, there's there, there'll be some kind of interesting twists that come up. A couple Very of cool. really, really good twists. Oh, um, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Yes, yeah. good, awesome. How? how so, I because I, I've had this conversation with Trish uh, via social media uh, when she first started uh, posting pictures and things about uh, like that as you guys started filming. Um, how, how do we, it, it, being in America, like how do we get our hands on, on watching it? Well, the way it's working is uh, we have an agency now in Los Angeles that are they're shopping to U.S. networks. So it's, hopefully it won't be too much longer before it will be airing in the States. Uh, okay. You know, I have relatives in England, relatives in Australia, and they're all asking me the same question. So it's just, uh, we, we just, we need, to be honest, we need a, a few more episodes so that you sell it as what's called a strip. Okay. And um, and so yeah, it will it will certainly play in the U.S. at some point. It's just a little early at the moment. But uh, but again, I don't know. I'm not a big computer guy. I, I think I was telling you I can't even put batteries in a flashlight. So uh, well, I can, but they're usually backwards. Don't but you hate uh, me? I I, hate I, um, I think that for your listeners and viewers, um, if if they're computer savvy, the network is called um, Bell Five TV One. Okay. And, and, you know, it's not a huge network, but it's Bell Fibe TV One. And maybe they can figure out how to do it. Um, yeah. Well, our listeners are all hackers, so I'm sure they'll figure out. Yeah, it's that they are. Yeah. <laughs> they just sit awesome. and mine uh, crypto all day and hack uh, TV networks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much else to do at the moment. That is true. That's all. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't really like talking about COVID, but how with filming this show, like how has it been uh, writing and filming it uh, with the whole pandemic looming this past 2020 and it's still kind of, you know, looming lingering, now, yeah. lingering around. Yeah, it certainly is. And yeah, it was challenging for sure. Um, we, we, we tried our best to, to do the masks or the visors and, and the rules were uh, according to the actors union, if I'm not mistaken, it's the actors union. Uh, had to have what's called a COVID, uh, like a, I, I can't think of the term, but that when you walked into the studio, uh, they would give you a mask or they would take your temperature, you yeah. know, just to see you're okay. And uh, we didn't have any problems, but yeah, it did, it did get a little frustrating at times, you know, because every time they just before they yell action, they would go masks off and oh, then wow. he'd yell action, they'd yell cut and they go masks on. You know, wow. so it was kind of frustrating, so, but we had such a nice bunch of people that just kind of got used to it, you know. I, well, I mean, Canadians, that's what, you, you know, you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody yeah, walking around set just yelling, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, Mexico, yeah. Mexico, nobody does. Sorry. Nobody does. <laughs> listen, nobody does insincere apologies better than Canadians. Right, right. <laughs> you can quote me. <laughs> that's right. Oh, and your buddy's there. <laughs> yeah, it's Gary. No Gary, pardon. sorry, uh, forgot his name. So that probably threw the, the not atmosphere, but like the, the rhythm off maybe a little bit for like actors that do this on a regular basis. That you know, they're yelling mass first, and then action, and then the the thing. Yeah, it, yeah. We actually, uh, like I said, I guess it's like anything. You get used to it, but good lord, it's annoying and gone. Yeah, it's yeah. just gone on way too long. Agreed. Like it's time to try a different approach. You know. Agreed. Uh, people are getting stressed out of their minds, and and it seems to me that, you know, without getting too down, I mean, it's just a lighthearted conversation. But you do find that, you know, now you're seeing suicides are jumping up, addictions mm-hmm. jumping up. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, pe- more, apparently there's higher HIV now. You know, um, so oh, that is, uh, wait, that's new. You know, just in Canada? Yeah, I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> what? It must be coming here. I don't. I haven't heard the that HIV. one. HIV. We're supposed to be trapped in our houses together. Yeah, How now, is HIV spreading? Now you're spreading it. Someone's not in quarantine. Yeah. So <laughs> one guy screwed all that up. Yeah. Ah, damn it. Not naming names. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Don't roll anybody under the bus. Nope. Wow. So in in Canada, is there like a an ant, like here in Arizona, uh, we we as like a the this city state whatever you want to call whatever we are right arizonans yeah. we don't believe in covid no we so it doesn't it doesn't exist no, yeah. okay there's like a Some small handful don't. yeah there's a huge like anti-masker movement here 
Yeah, I would say so. You think it's huge? Yeah, I mean, okay. if they're if they're flying a "Don't Tread on Me" flag, they they well, are completely. I just see a lot more people wearing masks than they than they're not though. Well, yeah, most you know of them just wear it so they don't have to be confronted by no, somebody okay. that yeah. you know, wear your mask, wear your mask, put gotcha. your mask. That they're wearing it for that reason, not because they feel it's going to save them or someone else. Right. So in Canada, is is there like an anti-mask movement or is, is oh. it a big debacle? Like, it's the exact, I would suggest it's the exact same as what you're dealing with. Oh, uh, oh wow. wow. Yeah, it's, a, you know, uh, people are fed up, you know. Oh, um, yeah. I, I've got my life down to, in such a way that I really don't wear a mask because of the way my life is. Like, for example, uh, you know, now I just pay at the pump when I get gas, you know, so you're avoiding as much as you can putting a mask on at all. And then I got the security guys loving me at uh, Walmart. So I go every every Sunday night at 1030 and I don't wear a mask because they know me, you know, and there's nobody left in the store because it's getting it's going to close. So yeah. I've, I've, I've adjusted my life in such a way that I'm really not wearing a mask. And, and the odd time I have to, well, you got to. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I would suggest that it's just like where you are, and, and sure, there's a huge anti-mask movement, and pe- people have had enough, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, the COVID for the most part has like basically accommodated most of my lifestyle because I, I, for one, like to avoid people in general. Yeah, I am happy. So this just kind of helps facilitate that a little bit more as well. Yeah. yeah. So you're so you're anti-mask and anti-people, just like yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm really. We're all realizing ourselves. Yes. Oh, no, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Every every day I stare at a, at, a, at a sailboat and think, you know, that's what I want to do. Just sail around the world in a boat by myself. Uh, Honestly, I wouldn't be that opposed to it. But I haven't been on a boat long enough to, like, know if I would really be seasick. Or, legs, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I've been on, like, uh, I, I'm originally from Wisconsin. And, and mm-hmm. I grew up maybe two hours from Chicago. Uh-huh. And they always have... I don't want to say the ferry. Yeah, it's it's like a booze cruise on a, a smaller. Of course, boat, it's going small, to Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah so it basically you pay to drink on the boat for yeah. a couple hours, and it's unlimited. But the boat goes out to Lake Michigan, like out in the middle of Lake yeah. Michigan, so you can see the skyline of Chicago, things like that. So I've done that a couple hours, but I don't know how I would feel like in the ocean, right? Yeah. I haven't been on a boat long enough either. Like a cruise. I've never been on like on a cruise. I don't think you would feel anything on a cruise. Yeah, it's probably like a big ass moving. Yeah, it's a big ass city. It's a good. And, and I've heard this too. This is the, what makes me not want to go on a cruise. It's basically, would you want to take everybody from Vegas with you out to sea for seven days? <laughs> <laughs> so when I heard that, and I was like, "Fuck, man! No. I don't think I ever want to do a cruise because." No. I can't do Vegas for seven days. No. Why would Ooh. I want to take seven people or the whole well, fucking strip? They have cruises strip? for like a weekend. What? So where does that go? Mexico. A week? Oh, well, I don't... What's there? <laughs> I guess... Teletech one? Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. I don't know. Donkey shows? I don't, I don't know. Oh. That, that is... It's Tijuana, it's right? Tijuana, yeah. So they stop at the port of Tijuana. <laughs> what kind of boat cruise is that? <laughs> Sorry. See, 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 Kim, how we just go off track. Sorry. No, no, that's quite all right. I was enjoying that topic. <laughs> we, should, we should carry on with that theme. Yeah, with the, <laughs> so have you been the, on a cruise ship? Yeah. And, <laughs> and, do, do you want to know something? I've, ne- I've never been on a cruise ship. I, the only thing I ever did similar to that, and, and talk about throwing up, uh, it was awesome. I took my car from uh, Leeds, England, put it on a ferry, and went across the North Sea to a place called Strafonger, Norway. And it was the worst crossing. The captain like came around at, when we were docking and said, "This is the worst crossing we've ever had." And all I remember is, you know those, you know those boxes. They're white on the outside and they're they're sort of silver tinfoil looking on the inside. You put Chinese food and stuff in it. They they have them a lot in New York. Anyway, the whole the whole ship was just wall to wall those boxes because you couldn't move without barfing. And they were trying to get you to barf in the boxes, right? <laughs> and yeah, it was horrifying. It was terrible. But um. Uh, no, never been on a cruise ship. If it's anything like that crossing, I don't think I want to. <laughs> <laughs> did you see? Did you see that they they made a, uh, a Titanic two? They are, and it's it's a cruise ship from New York to England. Really? Yeah. What you mean, like a real ship, or it's a movie? No, 
Oh, like it's a, a real, real ship. ship. Yeah. yeah but, well, that's cool. I think they'd be safe though nowadays. What? They, they're gonna be safe. I mean, it's, probably, it's gonna go down. You know what? I'll let it's the gonna first. It's gonna go down, but they're I'll gonna let... be safe. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That sounds like the first guy said that too. I, I think this will be this safe. Is safe. It's so <laughs> we built this so tough and strong. Yeah. We're not gonna go through any icebergs. <laughs> We'll Pay attention. attention. <laughs> How do you miss an iceberg? Like, I don't get... It was dark. Then, yeah, I get that. But well, you know, back then, you could probably see the stars better. They should have been better than that. Mm-hmm. Not without the and, I, no, I'm pretty sure the guy that was actually supposed to be looking out was probably drunk somewhere. On the no, ship. he was watching Leo and What's-Her-Face banging down there. Oh, that's true. That's what happened. Oh, he was busy. They, they weren't on the, on oh. the front of the boat? No, that was later, was I guess. Celine Dion? No. no, different part. That's no. a, that was the music video. I've only seen Titanic like five times. I've, seen, oh. I've, I've probably seen it five well, times. You know what's funny? Actually, no, I'll tell you what's funny that you're admitting that. <laughs> <laughs> it, we're, we're open books here. Yes, I do completely. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's actually pre, probably pretty close to how many times I've actually seen it. I, I mean, I was a teenager, yeah, when it like came out. high school, when that movie came out, and then Showing you know. Your age. It, had a girlfriend, you know, the high school sweetheart, and she's like, I want to go see it. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go see it. So she went and seen it with her friends yeah. at first, and then she's like, no, now we got to really go see it. And then I ended up having to go see it. So she even seen it more than I did, because I got dragged with her to go fucking see Call it. Call her later and find out how many she, times she's seen it. No, thanks. <laughs> That's one, I don't want to... Call any of my break. exes. No, no thanks. That's right. She, she's married, and her, her and her husband are watching it on a yeah. tape loop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, poor guy. So you yeah. got off lucky. Right. Five times. He's at 340 times. He wishes he was on that damn boat. <laughs> As it's going down. Yeah, exactly. Both that one and the second one, because you know that one's going to go down too. I'm just checking. I, I hope you don't mind. I'm just checking hockey scores. It's kind of the law being a Canadian. Oh, yeah. No, that's what? normal. Yeah, that's like football here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, did, you, yeah. did you watch this? Did you, did you guys watch the Super Bowl? <laughs> no, but my, my buddy, my buddy. Uh, so I, I do. I think one of the things I sent you was uh, I did a web series called The Drummist. And uh, I, I wrote all of them, but the uh, the guy that's in, that plays the drumist, uh, my buddy Bill, he's a huge he's a huge NFL fan, and he won uh, 3500 bucks. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. What did he, what did he yeah. bet on? P- pardon me? What did he bet on? Tampa Bay winning, or did he bet on something uh, uh, Yeah, I think squares? he did. Uh, I can't remember, actually. But, yeah, he was just, because well, he was too liquored up when he was telling me. Nice. He was, yeah. uh, two days later, he's still celebrating. But yeah, I, man, that's a lot. Of, that's good yeah, money. good money, yeah. Well, yeah, well, of course, we're talking Canadian, 3500 bucks. That's about 80 bucks U.S. Oh, oh you guys, you're, you're, no. <laughs> no. I thought you, you guys' the money went down? It was higher than ours. Yeah. Isn't it like nah. one to five maple you, leaves? You guys, yeah, yeah. How many maple syrups to one U.S. dollar? Because you guys have more than, I, it used to be you guys had more value than us. Yeah, we now. used to, but oh, uh, yeah, now? no, not anymore. It's, uh, I think, 35, let me think, 3500 uh, Canadian dollars would be, I'm totally guessing you're about Thirty five hundred would be about twenty eight hundred US. Wow. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So if you if you come to Canada, it's super cheap for you guys. Oh shit! I'm gonna I'm gonna look there. Yeah. You should. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's good strip clubs too. I've heard. I've heard. Do you have any favorites? Yeah. What's your favorite? Uh, yeah. No, those days are long gone for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know. ask, ask Gary. Gary, what are the, what are? The, Hang what on. The, I'll talk to. Yeah. Ask Gary. Apparently his lips are sealed. Um, yeah, yeah. No, we, uh, yeah, we did because you know being in a band. I mean, we, that's what you do. There's nothing oh, to do. Yeah. Usually, usually hanging out with the strippers in the day. So, uh, oh. but uh, no, those days are long gone. You know, oh, okay. although I still have five thousand dollar bail money on my American Express card. Oh, nice. Very cool. Just in case of emergency. Always. Exactly. Always. I mean, you come hang out with us. You might need it. That's true. <laughs> That's but where, where are you guys in uh, in Arizona? Like uh, the, the Coyotes play there. We, yeah, yeah, we're about we an hour away from their stadium. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're we're in the Phoenix like metro in, we're area, Phoenix. but yeah, we're uh, but the Coyotes are in Glendale. Suburb. Uh, we're in we're, Chandler Gilbert yeah, area, yeah. which is where it's a suburb of Phoenix. That's where we live at, and we're near Phoenix, where everyone knows kind of thing. And that's where Vince Ver- That's where Vince Fernier lives. Who's 
Alice Cooper. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, is yeah. that his real name? How funny. Yeah. I don't think yeah. I yeah. wouldn't even. Wouldn't I didn't even know that. But yeah, he is our. He's one of our treasures. That's yeah, I've actually been to Cooper's his restaurant, which is it's closed. Oh. It was, but when it was uh, open, I never went there. Did you, he had this hot dog that was like it was just a gigantic penis. <laughs> you can't, I can't. Yeah, do this that. is too, you can't, Yeah, we're on video. I can't. Yeah, no. I can't. It was like this. Yeah, you're running out of massive film screen space. Oh, screen, yep, screen space. <laughs> there, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, it was a big hot dog that Mark had. Yeah. Was there chili on it? Probably. Yeah. yeah. I don't eat hot dogs without chili. Come on. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I don't really eat hot dogs either. But. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was. Uh, I can't know you're being. We're being quiet now. Oh, we're being weird. Mm-hmm. Thanks. No, but yeah, we're probably about an hour from Coyotes. So do they they play in in the league up there or? Yeah, of course. How, yes. How does, okay. So I'm not a huge NHL fan, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it NHL no. up there? Yeah. Or, or is it? Yeah. yeah they have so there's also, there's they have... 30, 30 teams, I think, 31 teams. I think Seattle's getting a team, uh, which they were supposed to start this year, if I'm not mistaken. But now I would imagine with what's going on, they'll start next season. But, yeah, all, all the teams um, from the U.S. play in Canada. All the Canadian teams come and play the U.S., um, is it like and, a, rite uh, of, a rite of passage? Like, did you have to join a hockey team growing up, or I didn't have to. I wanted to, and it was it was uh, it was I was probably the worst guy, not only on my team but in the league. <laughs> like seriously bad. Like I, I, you know, I look when I, you know, I looked like I was skating on my ankles most of the time. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've only ever played uh, like floor hockey, like with like. A yeah, ball. I've only done rollerblades, and I was horrible at that. What you you did like rollerblade hockey? Well, in the streets, I grew up here, dude. I didn't have ice. All this street. I, I'm a, I'm a native to here in the desert, so yeah, we had I rollerblades. Did, I only did like in a gym, playing with a ball. Like I didn't. Well, that's a, that, yeah, that's weird. Floor that hockey, seems, yeah. So that it, seems weirder to me than the rollerblades because I feel like I'm least like gliding like skates, and I sucked at it. So yeah. Yeah. But but funny enough, this is a really interesting story. The uh, the best player on the Toronto Maple Leafs is from Arizona. Oh wow! Yeah, and he's half Hispanic. His name is Austin Matthews. Oh, is he? That's not Hispanic. <laughs> no, not, no, his mom. Yeah. I think it's his mom. Yeah, I'm I pretty think, sure yeah, he that's, speaks that's Spanish. Tip, that's I, a typical. I think. Uh... I think I think I got that right. Yeah, yeah. Matthews. That's really Hispanic sounding. Because <laughs> I heard there's a lot of there's been a lot of good players coming up in like the. I had a boss yep. here in Arizona that he, his kid was big into hockey or not hockey, yeah hockey, and he he was telling me about some of these players and that might be one of them that he brought up because oh yeah he was saying like this kid's great like he would play the rec leagues and stuff and yeah he was like this kid's amazing he would tell me all these people and I'm like oh yeah okay dude yeah really he's from him. Arizona but yeah he said Arizona has a lot of good hockey players apparently which mm-hmm. is, I wouldn't even think that yeah no there's like literally no ice. Yeah, Period. I mean, it's, you gotta go to the rinks. I mean, yeah. the most ice you get is in your drink. Yeah, that's true, that's and true. even that's crushed. Yeah, yes, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, or melted already, especially here. Yeah, it's melted yeah. In the summertime for it. sure. Yeah. Why? What is it hot there now? Uh, it's not bad. It, the yeah, high today terrible. was seventy-five. It gives you oh. an idea where it was at. You're up. Listen, listen. It's been so cold here. Like it's it's. Tw- I think it's t- about twenty today. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. It's most of the, the from now till about April. You don't even see your genitals. Oh god! Yeah, there, there I was, was in the pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, Sorry, it's cold outside. There was there was like a crazy winter front that came though. Is that some that you guys got then? Oh, it was northeast. incredible. It was northeast. That yeah. must have been what they some got that right probably. So, buddy, uh, the old guitar player I, I played with in one of my bands, he's three hours north of Toronto, and he said he's got skidoos, you know, for going through the snow. He goes, the snow's too deep. The sk- skidoos won't even navigate through the snow. That's how much snow they have. Wow. That, that doesn't sound fun at all. Is no, it, not at all, no. Is, is a skidoo, is that like a snowmobile? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking, you know, you know, the first thing I thought of when you said that, I thought it was a kayak. No, dude. I thought I thought it was the shoes that you put on, oh. with the, with like the rackets. I was like, Jeez, you put on the rackets. Guys, what are you, I know. What you, are know, you guys I, drinking? Sodas. <laughs> <laughs> but being in the desert, I've lived here. My, I mean, you should probably know that because being in Wisconsin. But me here, I, I don't know snow. 
So that's well, that's why I asked. I have an out. A snow, a snowmobile. I, I kind of had. At an least idea. you had a better idea than I did with me fucking putting rackets <laughs> in my shoes. <laughs> Put on my skidoos and go out in the fucking snow. It's too fucking deep. I feel like that's something you should say every time you leave your house. I'm going to put on my skidoos and go? Yeah. Fuck yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> All right, well, we appreciate that you came on uh, to the show. Um, can you tell us where our fans can find you and um, anything else that you have coming up more recently other than more pink uh, is in? Yeah. Anything, um, anything I know that... Uh, the, with regards to social media, it's always Pink is in Show. So Facebook, you know, Pink is in Show. Instagram, Pink is in Show. And what's the other one? Twitter, I guess. Pink is in Show. And then there's a website, actually. That might be easier. There's a website, uh, Pink is in .net. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, and I was there earlier. It, yeah. So yeah, I think it, I think there's uh, ways you can click to get to the social media stuff. Yeah. Yep, you but th- thanks very much for having me on. It was actually a good laugh. <laughs> we, we try. We try. Yeah, we try. Oh, it was good. It was, it was fun. Minimal so, effort. So when, it, when? So I know you guys have done five episodes, right? So when is when are you guys going to start shooting again, or what's going on with, or what's the uh, for episode six or? Yeah, so it'd be actually we we the next one we shoot is that episode five, and the idea oh. is that um, <clears throat> pardon me, we want to do it at the end of April. <clears throat> the start we're going to start pre-production in the end of April. That's the plan anyway. And then you guys want to probably try to get like ten or twelve, or hopefully, and then maybe try to sell it as a strip that like you mentioned. Yeah. Like so that. what the I, I mean the goal would be to shoot eight in a row, which yeah. would bring a total of twelve episodes, there and then go. hopefully more to come after that. But um, yeah, the idea is to shoot another eight. Very cool. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, but there's a lot of there's a lot of prep, you know, a lot of pre-production to get to the shooting point, and uh, so uh, the, the the beginning of it will be just uh, sitting everybody down at a table, like, and and going over the scripts and figuring out what works, what doesn't, and table reads, and then you know you meet with the various departments who, um, you know, the props ladies are so important, you know, whatever whatever we need, they got to go find it. Yeah. Uh, so you have lots of meetings like that just to, to pull it all together so you're ready on shoot days. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah you, don't, you don't think about all that back back of the room stuff. What kind yeah. of, what kind of yeah. props will you need? I know we were trying to end the show, but now I have more questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this guy. What kind of props would you need for a, prison? For a woman's prison? Toothbrushes. Shanks, Shanks yeah. <laughs> toothbrushes. yeah. Definitely toothbrushes. No, um, no, you'd be you'd be shocked actually the kind of stuff that you you need. And of course, my mind is completely blank. But um, so many times when we were on set, I'd go, "Holy crap! How'd you find that?" You know, uh, one of the things that was funny is that the um, the pr- two of the prisoners escape, but they're they're carving guns out of bars of soap, and we had to find a guy that could actually you know, whittle soap and make it look like a gun. We put shoe polish on it and it, it, it looked really great, but it, it's something you had to source. You got to find a guy who knows how to carve soap, yeah. you know, this sort of thing. So, wow. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you wouldn't even think awesome. that's a thing. Now, yeah. How many guns did he make? Three, uh, he made three. We had one backup. Um, so during the scene, it looked like they're carving the soap and then it cut sort of to later on and the, the, the guns are already assembled. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, th- it's things like that that you think are super easy, and then of course they're not. You got to find how to do it. No, there's always like that little thing. Like you never, you never notice the Pepsi can in like a movie in somewhere. Game, Game of Thrones. Yeah, in Game <laughs> of Thrones. The, Game of Thrones in the background. Cup yeah, sitting the background. on the floor somewhere. That's not. That wasn't an actual prop. But I, yeah. I'm just saying, like there are little things that are added to a set that you really don't notice. Uh, and unless you like really like the show, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god! Like I didn't even know that there was a Tampax box over there in the corner. Yeah, that you yeah. know, setting some of the scene, building you, the scene. Did you say that because of the women's prison? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so there was. Uh, I know there was two. a website. I don't know if it's still around anymore. But when they made the movie Gladiator, there was something like 300 mistakes, and really? somebody put a website together. <laughs> uh, and there's all one scene. There's one scene where he's wearing his watch, and there's another scene where uh, I guess they had him laying down, and they didn't want him to be uncomfortable, so they had a pillow under his head. And when they yelled action, they forgot the pillow was there. Ah, uh, so Russell Crowe looked relaxed. Basically. Yeah, as he's dying. 
That's awesome. <laughs> Man, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of drugs involved to sit there to find 300 mistakes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you're watching a lot to yeah. find, oh, that doesn't look right. That's not accurately right. They didn't have... No, you know what it was? It was, uh, it was? it was it was Mark's ex girlfriend oh, made her yeah. boyfriend go to see that movie three hundred yeah. times. Damn. That chick. So when Good your ex call is back. Nicely done. Thank you. Nicely done. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's All right. wind it. Let's wind it down with you. So yeah. Well, again, Gary's thank back. You. Gary's back. Thank you for coming on. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for having me on the show. Yes, Kim. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was good. Good laugh, and it was a pleasure meeting both of you. Yes, thank you as you. well. And when you guys have the, the season two premiere, we'll fly out to Toronto and hang out with you guys. Man, you, you're more than welcome. There's space here. Yes. As and our beers, our beers a little stronger. And the, oh, ooh, I like the challenge. Don't, don't keep me looking. I know. Yeah, it's wow. And let's make sure it's not in the winter because I don't have oh. my, my toboggans, Excuse my my, yeah. my yeah. racket shoes. Gonna, well, then cancel cancel news. your flight. Because <laughs> it's always winter. It's always winter, yeah. Rent, Damn Canada. Rent the, the skidoos there. Skidoos. Skidoo. Rent. All right. All right, Kim. Well, thank you, buddy. And Mark. Yeah, hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks yes. so much. This has been the Amigos PC. Make sure to like, subscribe, and review us on all your podcasting platforms. Visit us at AmigosPC.net for our entire library of content and Amigos merch. Till next time, adios.